So we all know uh, that AMR, so antimicrobial resistance, is becoming a more and more serious uh, problem. So uh, as antibiotics are maybe not uh, working as well uh, today as uh, <coughs> today as uh, uh, 10 years ago or 20 years ago, uh, this uh, brings up a lot of questions uh, how valid uh, the current uh, uh, or the data is that was uh, presented uh, so long ago. So, uh, and we also don't know how uh, well the antibiotics will be working in five years and 10 years. And uh, this is the reason we are uh, uh, looking at finding new uh, smart healing solutions uh, to solve the problems of the future. So we all know that every antibiotic that has been launched into the market has developed uh, slowly resistance. So penicillin was launched in 1943 and uh, the first bacteria generated resistance in the 60s. Same with methicillin, two years on the market, you saw resistance, gentamicin, vancomycin. These are all antibiotics that are used uh, frequently in, in septic uh, uh, surgery. And one scary item is that industry has stopped investing in development of new antibiotics. So you can see that we have this discovery void. Since uh, 1987, there aren't really any new antibiotics that have been launched into the market. So uh, we need to find new ways of combating infections and solving uh, the problems that we are facing. Just uh, to give an example, uh, a month ago, Novartis, and this is something that you have heard before already earlier today, uh, Novartis dropped its uh, complete development program and research program involving their antibacterial uh, development projects. So, uh, and they fired 140 uh, people uh, thereby. So uh, there's no real incentive for the industry to develop new concepts and new products to be launched into the market and then being taken off the market because of resistance development. Today we will be speaking about uh, bone regeneration in septic bone surgery. So uh, we have a few uh, talks about uh, uh, the resolution of cavitary uh, defects in septic bone surgery and also the resolution of uh, septic non-unions and, and gaps. So uh, Professor uh, Terry Beguet uh, from uh, Paris Sud will uh, be speaking about uh, uh, septic non-union management and uh, segmental defects and also Dr. Glombitsa from BG Duisburg. He's the chief uh, of the septic department uh, there in Germany, and he will also be uh, explaining how he manages uh, these kind of uh, patients. Uh, <clears throat> also, his approach uh, today will be more going through the literature and how he then can decide on what to do with uh, these patients. And he's presenting a few cases as well uh, uh, by using bioactive glass. Then we have uh, uh, Dr. Jan Gurtz, who will be uh, bringing forward uh, a very important topic, and that is that you know companies should not only deliver new products and solutions into the market, but actually the solutions that are brought uh, should not only heal but also optimally decrease costs. It's very easy to launch products to increase costs, but uh, there should also be uh, a benefit on the cost side. So he will be presenting uh, some recent cost-effectiveness uh, data. And actually, uh, Professor Nina Linfors will be focusing very much on the topic of segmental defects in preclinical uh, uh, models. So explaining uh, how one potentially in the future could use bioactive glass uh, to stimulate an intrinsic regenerative mechanism in vivo and uh, she will be presenting the first results uh, on that. So really going briefly into the uh, indication, so I just want to say that uh, we have an official indication to use bioactive glass in bone cavity filling in the treatment of chronic osteomyelitis. This is very important and it's indicated in instructions for use. And uh, also we have the claim that it inhibits bacterial growth. So uh, we are very fond of this and following the rules and regulations uh, that are put upon us. There are a few prerequisites to uh, 
perform the surgery in a proper way. The, the traditions are the same here as uh, uh, with any other uh, concept, proper debridement, complete filling of the cavity. We have had a few surgeons that uh, don't fill the cavity completely. Then you have hematoma formation and bacteria can go in there and, and start growing and then you have uh, uh, infection recurrence. So it's very important to fill the cavity completely and then soft tissue coverage. Without soft tissue coverage, it's really difficult uh, to have a, uh, a successful outcome and the prognosis is, is not so good. But here you can see uh, a Brody abscess that has been uh, de debrided and uh, this is a um, uh, five month post-op image. This actually, uh, this patient I believe is the first patient uh, to my knowledge in the field of septic bone surgery that has been operated on. And we have more than 11 year follow up on, on, on this guy, but I don't have the uh, image here, unfortunately. So this was done in 2007. Just briefly, the mechanism of action. Uh, this will not be covered too much in the later uh, uh, presentation, so I just wanted to bring this forward. So instead of having a pharmaceutical mechanism as uh, pharmaceuticals have, that antibiotics have, uh, this is a technology that utilizes a physical chemical mechanism. And uh, uh, through the ion release, the, the sodium release, and the, the release of the calcium silicate and phosphate, uh, you will have an increase, rapid increase in the pH and the osmotic pressure. And uh, this, uh, these two mechanisms will very effectively prevent the bacterial growth uh, where the granules are implanted. The same mechanisms occur if you take the granules and put them in a glass of water. You will have the same uh, reactions uh, as you have it when you put it in, in bone. And salt, as you know, has been used for thousands of years to prevent bacterial growth. So uh, there's uh, not much from that perspective novelty in this. We have just brought it into a medical device utilizing pH and then osmotic pressure. Uh, one benefit here is that you have a broad uh, spectrum efficacy. So uh, when you enter uh, into an area of the bone that you want to uh, perform the debridement on, sometimes you don't know what the germ is. Sometimes you have several uh, germs involved. Uh, so it's useful to have a, a material that has a broad spectrum uh, efficacy. So after debridement, cleaning, placing the granules, it's uh, not uh, as important to know what exactly is, is causing the germs on a local level. On a systemic level, naturally, it's very important to, to understand uh, uh, what is the pathogen. So there are a, lot, a long list of publications uh, about this topic, how the bioactive glass S53P4 can inhibit bacterial growth, and we are continuing studies. We have between five and ten uh, studies ongoing currently just on this topic and uh, even at this conference we have uh, gained several new ideas uh, what could and what should be done uh, to further validate and prove uh, this concept. So here you have a, uh, uh, an image of Klebsiella uh, that has been exposed two hours for the bioactive glass. Deterioration of the uh, cellular uh, membrane structure, you see pores in the membrane and, uh, and uh, thereby uh, death of the bacteria. So another interesting aspect is that the bioactive glass will uh, uh, then release the, the calcium and phosphate, which forms molecular cal calcium and phosphate that adheres to the surface of the bioactive glass. So this is a tool to produce the natural uh, hydroxapatite mineral in bone. So first phase inhibition of bacterial growth, takes one to two weeks or, or the duration is one to two weeks and after that uh, the production of HA. And this lays the foundation then for uh, the osteoconductive features of the material. And here you see uh, two images, one scanning electron microscopy image, how the surface looks uh, <clears throat> in about uh, uh, one to two weeks and then also the bonding uh, to bone. So you have the bioactive glass, the silica, the hydroxapatite and then the bonding to bone. 